you're going to shut up and you're going to take every course I tell you to take because I believe that you need to be an actor. Hey, this is the Charcha cast. With me today, a very special guest. It's Veer Das, world famous comedian. Thank you. <laughs> What's up, man? It's very exciting to have you here. Thank you for having me. Um, I've never been inside the embassy before. So I this know is it's very nice. you're in an undisclosed like bunker <laughs> location. Uh, so this is the Charcha cast. We're here uh, at the U.S. consulate in Mumbai. Um, thank you for joining us. A couple of things I want to talk to you about today, okay. and I figure let's just get right to it. Done. Um, one of the things that sort of well, I, I attended your most recent Netflix yes. uh, special, the taping. Of. Yes. Super funny. I'm a fan. And you were right up front. I was kind of right up front. <laughs> in the red section. strange <laughs> because I got in there and someone brought me to the front of the thing. All of a sudden, you're, you're three feet away from me. Yeah. Um, it's out now, the new Netflix special. It is out on Netflix. Uh, it's called For India. For India. Congratulations. That's Thank you, cool. Man. It's your third one. My third one. Um, but let's, before we get into the, the comedy special, let's take you back a little bit first. Um, you had kind of an, an interesting childhood, um, which you, in one of your Netflix specials, have a very funny bit on. Um, mm -hmm. But you kind of grew up in Nigeria, and then you were in India, yeah. and you were in the U.S. and Moscow. So my dad, uh, when I was a year old, uh, went to Nigeria for the sexiest profession there is, which is food processing. Nice. <laughs> so he was in Nigeria making uh, pre-cut potatoes and, and tomato pulp. Really? Yeah, that's what he was doing. Um, and then... Because uh, there weren't that many sort of Indian uh, language schools and my parents wanted me to have an Indian education. So when I was eight, uh, boarding school in India, okay. um, but parents still in Nigeria. Then about two years of, of uh, final school here and then I went to America for college. Okay. So, yeah. well, and, and what made you choose to go to the United States for college? I'd always wanted to uh, and I ended up uh, applying to every sort of big college that I knew because of movies. Right? So I applied to like NYU. I applied to Brown, I applied to all of these places without fully realizing I couldn't afford to <laughs> pay tuition for half of these places. And then uh, I had a neighbor who said, man, there's this college in Illinois that does like 90% uh, financial aid and diversity is really important to them. Uh, and so it's called Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, the mecca of civilization <laughs> as we know it. And it was just one of those colleges where... Uh, it was 1,100 kids, everybody lived on campus, and I think 300 of them were international. Wow. So, but this is something that, that we talk about a lot, too, mm -hmm. is we find that people try to apply to, like, the, the NYUs and yeah. Harvards, and, and you want yeah. the sort of bumper sticker thing. Yeah. But you ended up going to a fairly small, um, yeah. I won't call it obscure, but yeah. I, I, I didn't know yeah. what it was. Um, and you turned out all right. I don't, it, was, it was great. <laughs> it was... Uh, I mean, th there's two facets to it, right? I mean, you're scared when you're driving from O'Hare Airport for like three hours and it's just cornfield, cornfield, so you cornfield. You the big city of Chicago. <laughs> and then and you leave. Nothing. <laughs> yeah, right? And then it's literally cornfield, college, cornfield. But uh, I feel like you experience real America more when you do that. You know, like I had host parents who were in Galesburg and like my host mom worked at the Maytag factory and my host father was a trucker. And they take me out on like Harley Davidsons for the weekend, and so you, like, you live with them then? No, I mean they, they just took like, like, like every a, international kid gets a host parent. Oh, that's cool. And they kind of take care of you for really? for four years. Right? So okay, so what was the culture shock then for you? I mean, what was the biggest like besides the cornfields? It, I mean, it was just uh, I I went from Delhi University, which is just so many kids, to just eleven hundred kids, uh, and. You know, they say chimps breed in captivity. <laughs> so, you, like, to know everybody in your college is a new experience. Sure. And then also, the, the one thing that struck me as very interesting was, um, I don't know what I want to do yet. You know, through freshman and sophomore year. Which is such an alien concept to an Indian kid getting into college. Because yeah. we get into college saying, this is what I want to do. This is how, my, how much I want to earn by the end of college, etc, etc. So, I went to study econ and wound up a theater major. In, in sophomore year. You started off like the good Indian student. Yeah, right? I, was, I was like, <laughs> Economics. I was on Dean's List, I, I, I was doing well. Yeah. Uh, and I had this professor called Ivan Davidson. And he, he's passed now, but uh, I did a beginning acting course just on a lark. Because at Knox you had to take three subjects that were important to your major or in the direction you were headed in and then just one random subject. So, you know, through the years I got to study like jazz history or science fiction or Greek philosophy. And then I took beginning acting. 
and he kind of called me into his office at the end of it and said i say this to one kid every 7 years you're going to shut up and you're going to take every course i tell you to take because i believe that you need to be an actor oh so i was like man i'm on a scholarship for econ <laughs> and he's like you can do that too uh so he made me do like a double major but he of econ and theater the of econ and theater famous but famous parent <laughs> yeah. and and so my my theater gpa is like 3.8 my econ gpa is 2.1 <laughs> which I passed i passed yeah uh okay so that's super random right now for do you think he says that to everyone is this one of these things yeah, where the I, next kid means like I, i tell one person every well second. he kind of made me his teaching assistant the next oh, year so he nice. kind of really like championed my cause Um so what do mom and dad say though like I, I didn't tell them for the first year <laughs> like I called dad after like a year and I'm like you need to sit down I'm going to be an actor now and he's like no you need to sit down you're completing your econ major cuz <laughs> you know dad was spending uh, I don't know 6 7000 dollars a year yeah. at that moment in time which for us was a lot of money sure. so he's like you got to come through on your promise to us so I did you know Okay, so you you finish school. Yeah, I you have your dual major in, th- in theater and econ. You yeah. had this sort of epiphany. Knox College gave you the opportunity to do that. It, I just it threw me into everything America. And it was kind of cool. like I joined a frat. Really? Uh, yeah, I was a Sigma Nu, oh, right which on. was kind of like the the loser diverse frat on my campus at least. And I was rush chair in a frat um and which is re- recruiting which is recruiting I was in a fraternity as well. So. You know, uh not that frat culture is really valid in today's world <laughs> anymore mm-hmm. but you know, um I just kind of yeah, uh it was this there was one Kmart and one JC Penney and and a Taco Bell and a and a Dairy Queen and a McDonald's and that was the whole town. And and you're the the like the the golden example for Knox College now, right? Weren't you the val- not the valedictorian, the the graduation speaker? Yeah, I got a, an honorary doctorate last year. So I'm I'm Dr. Das. <laughs> and Does I would say what it's in? Is it like in <laughs> economics or something? Yeah, it says uh for contribution to the arts. I'm a doctor of the arts. But it was kind of weird because So here's Knox College's uh graduation speakers. There's Bill Clinton, uh Obama when he was a senator, uh Eva Longoria, Stephen Colbert, Ed Helms, and then me. <laughs> so it was the weirdest. Like and I followed Clinton, I think, because he was there Yeah, but that was your school though. You no, came up school. there, yeah. right? But yeah. fine, Clinton, whatever. But yeah. like you you cuz those kids can relate to you, right? They can say that that that's me. I enjoyed it for like 24 hours. For 24 hours my Twitter was Dr. Das and then I took it away. Then I was like, yeah, I'm not a real doctor. I'm taking it. What away. do you tell what do you tell them? Though? What do you tell kids at a graduation speech? I I just knew I wouldn't get by on wisdom, you know, because I I'm, I'm 40, you know, and all these guys have done so much. So I wrote a speech called the Be Stupid speech, which is uh that stupid is a good word hmm. and lean into and the stupid decisions we make define us far more than the you know the smart thought out decisions. God, amen to that. So lean into the stupidity in your life. That was my Well, right on. Ammo. And that's probably a, that would be a tough thing I think for an Indian student to hear, right? I mean, given yeah. the sort of the the culture of achievement and success. Yeah, and and, and, right. and I was surrounded by Indians who were computer science or econ or, or you know just very straight up majors. So when I'm like I'm going to quit all that and do theater agreeably a stupid decision amongst the indian community on campus but yeah all right so you finish school and then somehow you end up in russia so i <laughs> after um after i graduated from knox there's a theater called the moscow arts theater and there's stanislavski's theater and they kind of invented method acting so these are yeah. disciples of stanislavski right and they do a program in boston at the american repertory theater at harvard which is a six month program and they audition thousands of kids and they give 10 people a full scholarship uh and so <laughs> after you know four years of drama school at Knox and you know sitting in a circle and crying and and american theater professor saying i see what you're doing but take a different direction and emote with your shoulders and just foo foo drama things i'm with these russians in boston right <laughs> and uh the artistic director of the moscow arts theater day one kind of comes out and he's like acting very simple read script do live script then do what the hell you like <laughs> so i'm like after four years of all of that that was acting um so did that for six months with these guys and they were great uh yeah? like uh, uh, americans are very constructive with their feedback in drama school uh 
Russians are bullshit. You insult Chekhov. Get out. You know, they, it's just like there's no filter at all. They were fantastic. So you got a little bit of both. A little bit of both. All right. So you're done with. Uh, you finished up with the Russians in Boston, of yeah. all places. Um, and so, but so then, what is the path from sort of there to world famous comedian Virdas? Like, you didn't uh, just start doing stand up one day, right? No, I. Uh, so, final year at Knox because I. Uh, I just done so much serious theatre. I done like Chekhov and Shakespeare, and uh, I wrote a show called Brown Men Can't Hump uh, because there's a movie called White Men Can't Jump around the time. And so I did like, you know, the first time people do stand up, they do five minutes, 80 people. I did 90 minutes for 800 people at Knox, um, and you know, thought I was amazing because my friends had laughed at my inside jokes, and uh, I was applying to grad school, so I was. Uh, waiting tables and washing dishes at the Grand Lux Cafe in Chicago. Uh, and then I got into the Alabama Shakespeare Festival at the University of Alabama. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> right? with, the, with the aim saying, I'm going to teach Shakespeare. I'll do a PhD in Shakespeare and I'll be like Ivan. I'll be like a drama professor for the rest of my life. And in Chicago, I kind of started hitting open mics. And once that bug bit me, um, and three months before I went to grad school, I came back to India to save some money. So I'm like, I'll stay at home. I did a gig in Delhi. It sold out. And then I started getting more gigs. And so then I went to Alabama and I lasted four months. And I dropped out in four months. Wow. I was in Montgomery, Alabama for four months. Yeah, that's, 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 your, <laughs> that's your culture shock, I guess, right? Is, is it, was, it was okay. It, it, you know, it wasn't Alabama as much as it was. I, I felt like I've tasted the stage now. Uh, right. And grad school will always be there, and I can always teach at some point. How do you sell out a show in Delhi though? Right away, you, you already, I mean, is there a built-in audience or are you? No, it, it was, uh, so we went to this place called the India Habitat Center in Delhi, and we we showed the artistic director like a videotape of Brown Men Can't Hump, and she's like, "Okay, if you don't do that, <laughs> I'll give you a show." And at least you know, stand up had never been done in like a theater theater before in India, and. And uh, there wasn't anybody doing stand-up for like college kids. You know, there wasn't anybody saying the F word. There wasn't anybody talking about sex. It was just kind of 45 and above posh upper society British sort of stand-up. So suddenly when the tickets were cheap and, you know, college kids kind of came out and that just kind of set it off. Huh. And you, do you sort of trace that? event as the the beginning of Virdas or I mean what? I don't know what Virdas is yet but uh, it, no it was I moved to Bombay like that's huh. what made it happen okay. so after I, I dropped out of grad school I came back and, and what's what, 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 what's dad think about that oh, like, first of all I'm gonna go get a I'm gonna go get a PhD in Shakespeare <laughs> right? All right fine he settled right uh, it was terrible yeah yeah everybody was like he's lost you know and I'd also kind of met a girl in India so Dropping out was half, like, the girl wasn't going to come to Montgomery, Alabama, you know what I mean? So it was half, I really want to be a comic, and also half, I miss the girl. So everybody in India was just like, he did this for the girl, he, he's lost his mind, uh, he's so young, these relationships never work out, uh, which is partly right. Uh, and then the Times of India offered me a show in Bombay, it's called the Times Food Awards. And there's uh, a lady who I do a bit about in the special, Sabina. She mm -hmm. was my friend in the Taj, who okay. I lost in the Taj. Yeah. And she was editor of the, the Daily Times. And she kind of said, I like this kid and I'm going to push him. So she got me to the Times of India office in Bombay. And they were like, uh, we're going to put you on TV and we're going to make you a VJ. And I was like, cool, what's a VJ? <laughs> VJ like, like the old MTV days yeah, or something, right? right? Yeah. And so they just said, you have a week to move to Bombay. So I kind of just walked around in Marine Drive and I'm like, this looks pretty cool. And I called a broker and I found like a one room apartment in Bandra and that's what set everything off. Were you, were you actually a VJ? I was, I was a VJ for, I want to say three and a half months. I was fired in three and a half months because I was terrible. Doing music and stuff like, like the old Yeah, but the, the problem with comics is every, you know, VJs are the epitome of enthusiasm. Sure. So they're supposed to be like, I love this artist and I love this song and I just sounded sarcastic <laughs> the whole time because I didn't and I couldn't fake it. So yeah. Yeah, there's something like that's like the goofy FM morning show yeah. type of vibe, right? Which yeah. I'm sure you've done a lot of those yeah. as well. Okay, so then we, your your comedy career starts to take off a little bit. You, you build up some success. Um, let's talk now a little bit, shift gears a little bit and chat about comedy itself, your comedy. Yeah. Um, you know, I look back at 
sort of iconic comedians and stuff, and they seem to fall into a couple of different camps, right? Yeah. They're sort of the observational kind of safe humor, yeah. um, the popcorn type humor, and then there's stuff that sort of has like social implications, right? Yeah. You look at a guy like George Carlin mm -hmm. or Bill Hicks or someone like this. Yeah. And I sort of see you in you using your comedy more for social commentary versus the, you know, sort of the Seinfeldian. Yeah. Was that a conscious decision or something you're interested in? I think it's just where I am now, man. Like, I, you know, I, what a lot of us don't realize about India is we're all babies, right? I'm, I'm 12 years in. Chappelle is 30 years in. Huh. Bill Burr is 30 years in. Kevin Hart, Chris Rock. Carlin, at his best, was like 35 years in. Stand-ups, the older you get, the better you get. You know what I mean? You find your voice like 20 years in. So I just don't know. But Why does it take that long? I, it just... I still am not fully myself yeah. on stage, but I look at a guy like Bill Burr or Chappelle or Tig Notaro or, you know, and they just themselves, they improvise in themselves, they found their voice and that, that's what epitomized like Richard Pryor or Carlin, right, or Eddie Murphy. So for me, it's, I don't think you can live in a country like India um, and want to be an authentic Indian voice, which is very important to me, and not address these things. Mm. You know, you can't. We're too much, you live here, too much changes every day on a day. It changes faster than most places in the world this country is changing right now, because we're developing still. So you can't not talk about it. And you know? I, I want to be a little bit careful about this, because mm -hmm. I'm a guest in, yeah. in India. And, yeah. um, but this idea of you can't, you can't not talk about it, mm -hmm. right? But we talk to people all the time yeah. who give us various permutations of, eh, I'm a little bit caught, I hold back a little bit, I'm worried about backlash and stuff. Is, is that a concern for you? Well, you know, it, it, it oscillates with, with leadership. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, you know, and, and I've been doing it 12 years, so I've seen different permutations of that. There are sensitive times and there are non-sensitive times. The, the way I always look at it is three things. I have a strong moral compass and my moral compass is inherently patriotic, you know, so I don't think there's anything more patriotic than parodying your country, you know, and I don't view that as dissent, I view that as democracy. So that's one. Two, there's nothing anybody can say to me that, that is worse than the things I've said about myself on stage, right? So uh, the ratio has to be, I've got to make fun of myself more than I make fun of the audience. And then you'll always be okay. And the third is, the audience teaches you. You know, if a joke is horrible, or if it's offensive, or if it's wrong, you will catch silence. And there is nothing more terrifying than silence. It's worse than an investigation. It's worse than being trolled on Twitter. It's worse than being called out. Silence from an audience is the worst feeling in the world. So that's your benchmark for, for yeah. where my line is. If I, if I yeah. try out a new joke and I get nothing, then I know I probably... Yeah. I trust my audience. Yeah. You know, and... and I mean, I'm charging them enough money where they're, they're pretty educated, <laughs> you know, and they're... They're not coming in blind to stand up, so yeah, I trust them. Do you but do you give that same advice to young comics who are coming up to say give it no, a shot? No, I, I tell young comics to say anything. Yeah, yeah, because the you know I I didn't the first time I put stand up online was on Netflix, so I wasn't putting stuff on YouTube yeah. every week, etc. Like a lot of young comics are, so they they catch feedback a lot earlier than than I did, and. That feedback's brutal. Like we live in a world right now where a 26-year-old comic is expected to be politically correct and woke and know everything, and that's just impossible. He's not going to, or she's not going to. So just say anything, stumble, learn. You know, you'll figure it out. But this early in the game, don't second guess your instincts. You know. Do you? So do you look <clears throat> back though at at let's say, like take Dave Chappelle for example. Mm -hmm. if you, Chappelle show was by far probably my favorite yeah. piece of, of of television I've ever seen. But I think if you look back now at some of the episodes and some mm -hmm. of the stuff he was doing, he couldn't get away with it today. I don't no, think. it's not woke enough and it's not politically correct enough. Yeah. Right. And so, but uh, is there any of, is the legacy in your mind at all that boy the stuff I'm saying today, 20 years from now, I'm going to be called uh, you know horrible names or this isn't going to be acceptable? I, I think you limit yourself as an artist if you think about those things. Yeah. You really, man, this is a profession where any artistic profession, what three percent of the people in that profession are managing to eat off of that, you know, particular profession. It's a privilege just to be on stage and to be able to gig and support a house and, you know, to be able to do that stuff. 
you'll get in your own way, I feel like, if you second guess yourself. But research, I'm not averse to. So, uh, the second Netflix special, I had a bit about feminism, right, and about women's clothing. So, to do due diligence and to talk to like 10 different women of 10 different sort of intersectionalities, do that, you know, so that at least that informs your joke. You, you should, don't have to be, don't be uninformed when you do a joke. You know? but, but you're at the you're, but you're at the point, and like other fame or well-known c- comedians, where one thing can derail you, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean that that's got to be terrifying to a certain extent. That I'm I want you to use CK as an example, but but mm-hmm. your one mistake, yeah, away from pariah status, yeah, right? or from cancel culture, or whatever. But I also think, I mean, the audience is very intelligent, man. They they know, like, uh, there's. Uh, a Louis C.K. version of that. There's also a Kevin Hart version of that. Mm. You know what I mean? And and there's, you know, so Kevin Hart said some very unwoke things in his past, but I feel like he's evolved as a person and he's going to be okay. You know, he'll still continue to have a career um, as long as he addresses it and apologizes, which in some way, shape, or form, I think he he has. Um, the audience understands, and the lovely thing about stand up, as opposed to acting, as opposed to music is you can write something horrible and pay the price for it and then a week later you can write something beautiful hmm. and, and you can make up for it. Yeah. You know, this is a very democratic profession in that sense. Right on. Uh, let's shift just a second to mm-hmm. um, you sort of taking the United States by, mm-hmm. by storm. Um, do you worry about, you know, Mindy Kaling has talked about this and um, the sort of the Indian stereotype and, you know, every, all the Indians you see on television have the same sort of typecast and stuff. Is, is that a concern? I, you know, I, I, don't, I, I think that's changing. Yeah. The, and not nearly as much as we'd like it to, but I, I view that in two senses, right? Number one, um, Bollywood is the biggest film industry in the world right now. We release seven films every Friday. In 80 years of making cinema, uh, or maybe 65 years of making commercial cinema, the only role we've ever given a white guy is kill the Indians. <laughs> that's the <laughs> that's the only role we've ever given. So, so it goes both ways. So it goes both ways, right? So let's let's not be too hypocritical about wanting characters with depth. Um, I'm not averse to playing a stereotypical character if the character has depth. I would play a taxi driver, I would play a terrorist, I would play a doctor, I would play an IT engineer. But what doctor? What taxi driver? What IT engineer? Hmm. What does he have to say? What is their story? I'm absolutely on board with playing those things. But you've got to give me depth of character. Do you want to do more serious stuff, given you have an acting background? Would you take I, a serious role? I think so. I mean, right now there's, uh, you know, Whiskey Cavalier was kind of nice because I, I just played a guy who was bad with people and good with guns. You know, and that's... Not something Is you that see. Is a reflection in, on your? Uh, <laughs> not really, <laughs> but it, it's not something you see an Indian guy playing, right? We're yeah. always likable, show up to work, integrate, happy, go lucky people on American television. So just to play a salty guy who hated people and you know, and killed people was, was kind of refreshing. Um, I just did an episode of Fresh Off the Boat, which was kind of nice. Okay. Uh, which might be a possible spin-off. Really. Uh, around an Indian family, um, and it's it's me and. Uh, there's an actress called Preeti Zinta, who's a big Bollywood star. So it's both of us as young parents uh, in, you know, this this one motel in the 90s. So it is, uh, you know, a typical setting, but a very atypical, uh, like, untypical story. So that might be nice. And what's what is what has been your reception though in the <coughs> United States? Do you do you find your audience in the U.S. is in, are Indian Americans? Is it everybody? So post the Netflix specials, it's kind of now 50-50. Cool. You know, and. What's strange about that is I find that most Americans are now looking for an authentic story, you know. So they're not looking for you to give them their version of India. They're looking for you to give them your version of India. Yeah. And they're genuinely interested in that. I learned that with the next special. So the first special, I was kind of like, OK, I'm going to talk about gun control. I'm going to talk about breakfast cereal. I'm going to talk about things that are important to Americans. And then. In the second special, when it came time to tell my story, I kind of worried about it. I'm like, are people going to buy into, you know, the Mahabharata on stage or to, you know, my family or... And strangely enough, that saw far greater response amongst Americans and Brits. And, huh. you know, so they're interested in diverse stories now. So, so you were telling me a story um, off camera that 
before you launched, right, the night the, the Netflix special launched, mm-hmm. you were on the phone with your attorneys. Yeah. Is that, a, that's a true story. That's a true story, yeah. And I, I always am for this one. Yeah, it's, you just have to be prepared. Bec- like I've been in three movies where, you know, a, a PIL is filed against the movie, et cetera, et cetera. And you kind of handle that stuff. But, you know, India is 1.3 billion people. It's, you could put a picture of a puppy up on screen and somebody's going to be upset at that as well, you yeah. know? So, yeah, okay. Part Fair and enough. parcel, you know? Um, can, you, do you re- can you relate, though, to what your, your fellow comics from other countries? Do they go through this same type of a thing? The different challenge? Like, what's unique about sort of the challenges you think you face? I mean, I'm, I'm in a good position. I'll tell you why. Um, there's comics in the Middle East, for instance, or comics in Africa, for instance, who... Legal trouble means a lot more than just admin and paperwork for those comics, yeah. right? Um, and also, they don't have the large audience th- that we do to fall back on. You know, there's, uh, there's, there's a, an Egyptian comic who's like the, the, the John Stewart of that region, who has a hard time getting a live gig, hmm. you know, but is viral every week and has cases against him and has to do a show from outside, I believe. But here, there's 1.3 billion people. It's... No matter what kind of comic you are, you hit such a large audience so early in your career, somebody will find you. So that's, you know? that's the other side of the I'm always going to offend someone coin then, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I'm going to always offend somebody, but... But I'll always like have an audience. Too, right? yeah. yeah, and a sizable audience. Huh. There's, I mean, there is an English-speaking audience in America for stand-up comics that is the same size, uh, in India, that is the same size as your American audience. Yeah. There is an America in India that will watch English stand-up comedy. Do you have any sort of thoughts about doing Hindi stand-up comedy or...? So, I play uh, a serial killer in a show soon, which is a Hindi stand-up comedy. Oh, right on. So, I did 10 episodes of Hindi stand-up comedy and it's the toughest thing I've ever had to write. Really? Why? I I don't think in Hindi. Um, And there is a nuance to Hindi and a depth to Hindi that uh, you can't fake. You know, so there's comics like Zakir Khan or, or Johnny Lever who are profound storytellers with really just a, an emotional depth that somehow you can't get to an English stand-up comedy. That's interesting. You can be far more emotional and real in Hindi stand-up. Yeah. And I'm just not there yet. But you're getting there. So mm-hmm. what, is, what, is, what is next? I mean, first of all, how do you have time to do, you got like 50 <laughs> different things, right? You're I'm doing this thing on Amazon, I'm this thing yeah. on Netflix, and I got my stand-up special. Like, wh- what's... How do you find balance? I'm working with as many people as I can work with and just delegating in that sense. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's a good management agency in the U.S., there's a good agency in the U.S. And I'm at the point where I can kind of have an idea and I've spent time building a team that can take that idea and run with it. I've got a small company here and they, they're kind of like, okay, he has an idea, half of it is crazy and half of it is good, let's take the good part and turn it into something. You know, they're, right they're kind of there. Uh, before we wrap up, there's one thing I, wa- I, I do want to bring up. Um, I'm very interested in decision points. Yeah. Um, and so, especially w- we talk to people all the time who make that leap, right? I'm mm-hmm. sure there are thousands of people who said, I've always wanted to be a stand-up comic or I've always wanted to do acting, but, mm-hmm. I, you know, no way I'm going to, like, take that next step. Yeah. What do you say to people um, who come to you and, you know, I want to be a stand-up comic just like you or I want to be an actor, but my parents are, are going to disown me? Like, what, what, do you say, what do you say to that person? At the end of your your run, right, at whatever career you're at, you're going to look back at emotional points. You're not going to look back at um, the title on the wall or the trophy or the whatever. You're going to look at back at you look at a trophy and and remember how you felt mm. getting that trophy. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. All right, uh, I'd done stand up in India for eight years, and. I kind of slept walk through it, I'll be honest, right? I was doing a corporate every month, I was running the history of India. It was on autopilot and it was just a certain amount of income every year and I was doing Bollywood movies. And at some point CAA, which is the American agency, signed me and they said, come over to LA and take some meetings. Uh, so you go in there thinking this is going to be a great vanity trip and I'll take some meetings and we'll see what will happen, right? But I'd never really thrown myself into stand-up and they said, why don't you do five minutes at the Laugh Factory on a Tuesday night on Which Sunset? Is a Bo- big deal comedy club in the United in Right? The but five minutes. And I hadn't done five minutes in a while. You know what I mean? I'd been doing longer shows and working big venues. And so 
because all of the material that I had written was kind of corporate and kind of safe material, I picked something that I had written six years ago to do five minutes at the Laugh Factory. Wow. So I go up at the Laugh Factory, it's Tuesday night, uh, because I'm the new guy, it's 11.30 at night. And I did it. And the next day, um, the owner of the Laugh Factory is a guy called Jamie Masada. And he kind of called me down. He's like, who are you? Where are you from? So I'm like, I'm, I'm just in town visiting. He's like, come back tomorrow because I think you have something. Right. So I came back the next day. And usually the new guy gets five minutes on the top of the late show. He had put me at the end of the early show between Whitney Cummings and Dane Cook. Wow, you're kind of opening for Dane Cook. That's right. Cool. So and I had 12 minutes. And, you know, so Dane is headlining, Whitney is, you know, this thing, and there's eight comics before then. So I'm just sitting there watching Whitney Cummings destroy. She's so good, she sucked all of the energy out of the room. And I'm terrified. And I went up, and I did 10 minutes, and I was probably more fulfilled by that 10 minutes than I was in the last eight years of my career. Really? It felt that good, because I did well. Right. And so that's a big emotional decision point for me. And from that moment on, I just remember walking off stage going, why haven't I been doing this seriously for eight years? And that was a decision point to throw myself into stand up. So all of a sudden I go back to this agency and I'm like, I'm signing with you, but now send me to comedy clubs. Send me to every like, let me do the, the Addison Improv. Let me do New Mexico. You know, let me do just small venues and let me get good at this again. So you can only trust that emotional beat point of how you feel. So what I tell people is only do this if it makes you feel like nothing else will make you feel. You know, that's when you do this. Like life was pretty good in India, but I kind of signed up for this America experience that I never planned on because of 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, so if it makes you feel like nothing else makes you feel, much like if a person makes you feel like nothing else makes you feel, yeah. that's every reason to do it. We should probably end it there. I don't know, <laughs> how, to, I don't know how to top that. That was a great, that was a, a, a wonderful story and a, and a good way to end things. Um, Veer Das, a uh, new Netflix special is out right now. It's for India. Go see it. It's very funny. You'll probably get to see this guy uh, in the front row <laughs> at some point. Um, he's on Amazon, he's uh, doing gigging at clubs everywhere, Veer Das, you can't miss him. Uh, but you got to s uh, spend some time with him here with us today. Veer, thank you so much thank for coming in. Thank you, so. this really fun, appreciate man. it. Thank, thank you. you.